I don't love the term midlife crisis. I would call it the midlife chrysalis. Many of the transitions we go through in midlife are normal. To call it a crisis suggests it's like somehow you're doing it wrong. That's why I call it the midlife chrysalis instead of the midlife crisis. On the other side of it is more happiness and frankly, more of a sense of purpose as well. Oh, hi, Chip. I'm super excited to uh, have you on Garden Infinity. Thank you, Michael. It's great to be with you. Yeah, so I'll give a quick intro to you and then we'll just have a bit of conversation and um, had a lot of fun uh, with you in, in Miami in April. And so that's where we first where we first met. And uh, we have a lot, a lot of great knowledge from you in store today. But uh, as a quick introduction, you've been a hospitality industry disruptor twice now. So you started uh, Joy de Vivre Hospitality, which is one of the largest hotel brands in the United States. And then you also helped turn Airbnb into a multi-billion dollar online marketplace. And so no small feat for sure. And on top of that, you've also been an author of one of the New York Times bestseller and now the founder of Modern Elder Academy, which really helps people in midlife discover a renewed sense of purpose. And that's what really uh, drew me to you as well. I know during uh, in Miami, you gave a, a session at the YPO Converge conference and the thought provoking thoughts around you know, what gets better with aging, for example, or what would you regret um, if you didn't do this in the next 10 years really helped me reframe as well and to get really excited, you know, still relatively young, still, uh, some people might call me an elder millennial, <laughs> but uh, still on the young side. And so it was really exciting for me to really think about aging gracefully. Um, but really curious just to hear a little bit about, you know, what made you begin this work and uh, what, what inspired you? Sure. So, you know, I was a CEO for 24 years of a company I founded, Joie de Vivre. And um, when I sold it around age 50, I didn't really know what was next for me. And there's a, in the movie, The Intern, uh, Robert De Niro, uh, this is with Robert De Niro and Anne Hathaway. He was the senior intern. He says, um, musicians don't retire. They quit when there's no more music left inside of them. <clears throat> now, I was not, not a musician, but I was you know, an entrepreneur and a business person. And I knew I had music inside of me. I wouldn't have called it wisdom, but now I would because now I understand more of what it was. And so this was about 10 years ago and 10, 11 years ago. And I was not sure what was next for me. And it was around that time I got a call from Brian Chesky, the co-founder and CEO of Airbnb. It was a little tech company in San Francisco. No, not too many people ever heard of it. Uh, I was a hotelier. I'd been created 52 boutique hotels. I knew a little bit about Airbnb, but not a lot. And long story short is I joined Brian as his in-house mentor, along with his two co-founders, who I helped to mentor as well, uh, as the head of global hospitality and strategy. But my role was much broader than that. And ultimately, a few months into it, Brian said to me, Chip, you're our modern elder. And I said, I don't want to be your modern elder. That makes me sound old. But, but I was old. I was twice the age of the average employee in the company. I was 52, average age is 26. And he said, Chip, a modern elders as curious as they are wise. And when I heard that, I was like, wow, okay. If that's what a modern elder is, I will be a modern elder. And so I spent seven and a half years helping Airbnb um, grow into a mainstream global brand um, on many levels. Uh, four of those years were full-time three and a half years as a strategic advisor. And um, it was when I was the uh, strategic advisor and living down here in Baja in Mexico, uh, part of the time I started working on a book called Wisdom at Work, The Making of a Modern Elder. And that's when I came up with this idea of, um, well, why don't we have a midlife wisdom school? Where do people go in their forties, fifties or sixties to sort of reimagine what's next for them? And uh, so MEA started uh, in January of 2018 and has now had 2,500 alumni from over, over 40 countries. Wow, that's, uh, that, that's amazing that you've already had this uh, kind of individual impact. And, and I'm sure people have uh, really uh, changed their life for the better by just a simple mental shift. Um, at Garden, we actually, our vision of well-being is mind, body, and environment. And so any mental techniques like meditation or mindset reframes, or I, I remember you talked about growth mindset, Carol Dweck, and uh, being, being a student of that. 
are, are super important because they can influence everything else, just like, you know, proper nutrition can, or the right environment, you know, the right lighting, the right temperature and so on can really, or even toxic or in, not toxic cultures can really influence your well-being. So to tell me a little bit about that, that mindset shift and, and how that influenced your well-being and others' well-beings as they went through the Modern Elder Academy. Well, yeah, let me, so we, being the world's first midlife wisdom school, our primary role is to help people cultivate and harvest their wisdom. But there are four, there are four key pillars of our curriculum that we've developed with professors from Stanford, Harvard, Yale, and UC Berkeley. And the first one is reframing aging. <laughs> so how do we help people to reimagine their relationship with aging? Generally speaking, we live in a society where anti-aging is not just a term, it's actually a whole industry. <laughs> you know, anti-aging creams. I'm like, yes. we, don't, we don't have anti-male or anti-women creams. We don't have anti-black creams. We don't have anti-gay creams, but we do have anti-aging creams. So it is an interesting thing. There, there's an element of helping people to understand that if they can shift their mindset from a negative to a positive perspective on what gets better as they get older? What are the unexpected pleasures of aging? Um, they actually gain seven and a half years of additional life. That comes from Yale professor Becca Levy. It is, it is. So the first part of this is to help people to understand the aging process, to understand what does get better with age, et cetera. The second piece is mindset, as you mentioned. How do you shift, how do you shift from a fix to a growth mindset? Um, and that's based upon the work of Carol Dweck at Stanford. Um, and that's pretty important because as we get older, if we have a fixed mindset, our life gets smaller and smaller. And we, you know, we become sort of the, the, the you know, miserable old uncle that is cranky all the time. Um, or, or, or aunt, doesn't have to be just uncles. Um, third, the third uh, pillar is um, the idea of transitions. So we live in an era where we have many more transitions than we used to in adulthood. And that's partly because people change where they live, change their partner, change their job or boss, um, decide to go back to graduate school at age 50. Back in the past, we didn't have as many transitions. Therefore, we didn't necessarily help people to know how to navigate their midlife transitions. And uh, so we talk about transitional intelligence or TQ. How do we elevate the idea of transitions to an art form that you can understand how you go through a transition and the three stages of any transition. And then the fourth piece really gets to your, your discussion about environment and that's regeneration. So, so we've, we're creating regenerative communities like residential communities built around a regenerative farm or ranch. Um, you know, regeneration doesn't have to show up necessarily in a farm or a ranch you live on, but it can show up in the practices that we try to you know, adhere to, practices that help people to re regenerate their purpose, regenerate their soul, uh, regenerate their sense of community and their sense of connection with the place they live and the people they live with. So, um, and, you know, our, our alumni community is very regenerative as well. We have 26 regional chapters around the world. So on a personal level, the thing that regenerates me is, my, is, is mindfulness in the form of uh, meditation. So med meditation, I've been doing meditation for 40 years. Wow. Yoga was what was always really hard for me, Michael. And so it, I really had to look at why do I have a closed mindset? Why do I have a fixed mindset when it comes to yoga? And it was partly because I just thought of myself as the most, you know, stiff person in the room. And uh, so I realized that the trigger for me on yoga was the fact that I cared too much what I looked like to other people. You know, I was I was comparing and so I, I, got, I got over that challenge by actually just asking our mindfulness teacher at MEA to do one-on-one -on -one sessions with me, which meant that the only person who was seeing me was, was Teddy, our mindfulness teacher. And from that point forward, I started to love yoga because instead of being doing yoga and just comparing myself so I wasn't really inside my body, I, I, I learned that if I can see the trigger that actually is shutting down my ability to be mindful about this experience, um, it can actually allow me to sort of um, to to fall into that experience in a way that's really healthy. Wow, that's such a great example of using, you know, shifting your mindset and then doing something that then was really beneficial to you. I mean, I can super relate to that as well. Um, early on, um, my, my early 20s, I learned about, um, I did this thing called landmark education. 
I don't know if you've heard about it before, but I've it's heard, yeah, yeah. shifting mindset as well. And one of the things I learned about myself is that I basically uh, consistently wanted to act perfect in order to get my uh, the love of my dad, because I never thought I was good enough for him. And that was because I observed him at a dinner table, just consistently working. And I just wanted his attention. And then I, and I kind of created the story like, oh, I guess he doesn't give me my attention. I have to be achieving as my, you know, have to get, get good grades, have to get the best jobs, most prestigious jobs to make sure that he loves me. And it was all a story I created in my head. And when I realized that, I was like, wait a second. I've never told him that I love him, for example. And at one point called him up and I said, hey, I have this story about you. You know, I love you, dad. And it completely changed our relationship as well. So I can, I can super relate with just how powerful mindset can be and, and, and that shift yeah. and then doing things that we thought weren't possible even in the first place. So, so, so thank you for sharing that. That, that really resonated with me. Um, thank you. And the, the other thing that, that I remember when, when we were in Miami that was quite eye-opening was kind of the U-chart that you showed mm, where, yeah. and, and you put uh, 47 years kind of at, at the bottom <laughs> and that really redefined midlife crisis for me. So, so talk a little bit more about that. I'm, I'm curious. Sure. So the U-curve of happiness is social science research that's been done all over the globe. And what it's shown is pretty consistently that from around age 20 or 22 till approximately 45 to 50 or 47.2 on average, um, people's life satisfaction in adulthood actually declines. And then ar around 45 to 50, it actually bottoms out and then it starts to go up. And so people are happier in their 50s than their 40s, happier in their 60s than their 50s, and happier in their 70s than their 60s. Now, that does not fit the societal narrative on aging because it's sort of like, oh gosh, you get to your midlife crisis and then on the other side of that, you have disease and decrepitude and death. But in fact, it's quite different than that. And people actually get happier after that midlife crisis. Now, I don't love the term midlife crisis. I would call it the midlife chrysalis. Um, you know, it's, this, it's, the, it's the second phase of the caterpillar to butterfly journey. It's actually the time when you're sort of you're shifting and there's something major that shifts around midlife, around 45 to 50. And it can happen earlier, it can happen later, but that's the average. And what's shifting is often the operating system that's defined you is moving from your ego to your soul. Uh, you're, you're getting less focused on what other people think of you. Uh, you are more interested in how do you serve people than how are you being served. Uh, and you start to maybe take on a little bit of that role of being the modern elder. And so I don't, you know, I think many of the things, many of the transitions we go through in midlife are normal to call it a crisis suggests it's like somehow you're doing it wrong. But the truth is, I think most people go through menopause and what they go through empty nest syndrome and they go through, you know, feeling like, Oh man, I, I need to change my job and et cetera. These are just normal things. Um, that that's what that's why I call it the midlife chrysalis instead of the midlife crisis because it truly is yeah you know in that in that chrysalis or that cocoon it can be dark and gooey but on the other side of it is more happiness and that and frankly often more more of a sense of purpose as well. Do you do you think there has to be a you like if you, if you succeed with Modern Elder Academy can it just be you know consistent? Yeah, <laughs> it's interesting you ask that. So about fifteen percent of the people who come to MEA, uh, Michael, are millennials, and you'd say like, wow, why would someone in their thirties or maybe early forties come to a place called the Modern Elder Academy? And it's partly because if you're a thirty-eight year old software engineer in Silicon Valley, you are an elder because you're often surrounded by people. 10 and 15 years younger than you. If you're a fashion model, you're from an advertising agency executive, if you're pro athlete, same right. thing. I think you can flatten that curve. And, and, and I think millennials are doing a great job of it mm -hmm. because I think yeah. what, what part, part of what the curve is about is waking up in midlife and realize you're living someone else's life or you are, you're living your life based on someone else's success script. The script you're defining in your life is it should be is your own. You should be writing your own screenplay, and in fact, you're reading you're you're reading from your parents' screenplay or from society's screenplay. 
And it's often around that time. And I think what's be beautiful about millennials is millennials have not been as focused on doing things the traditional way. Uh, so many millennials like, oh, I'm taking a year off. I'm going to be a digital nomad. I'm going to go. I'm going to go back to graduate school in my late 30s. I'm going to take a year off, you know, and and just uh, you know read. I mean, there's there's less of one linear path. For for those of us in the United States, we know a book uh, or a, a board game called The Game of Life, and that game was so old school. It was like, okay, there was only one linear path through life. And you got extra points if you got the job, got the marriage, got the kids, got the house. And it was, it was frankly really boring. <laughs> it wasn't, a, it wasn't a particularly interesting game. And I actually don't think most millennials grew up with it because like, oh, that's a whole different era. So I think that the more people learn to sort of create their own success script at a younger age, the less likely they will have this emotional equation that was one of my books called emotional equations and one of the equations is disappointment equals expectations minus reality and uh, that's, that's very profound let's uh, let's let's mention that again <laughs> dis dis disappointment equals expectations minus reality and it is often in our 40s that we have realized that oh i had all these expectations how my life was going to be and i can now see the future, and I don't think I will be president of the United States, or I will not, right. you know, I, I didn't marry my soulmate, in fact, and my kids, they're terrible. They're not, they're not <laughs> the kids I've expected. And so you, so it's a time, it's, it's often a time when people are readjusting those expectations. But I think what's beautiful about millennials is that millennials have been adjusting their expectations all the way along the way. It, it, it's not like you just sort of said, okay, this is the way I live my life. And then all of a sudden, one day you take off the blinders, like, oh, there's a whole other world out there. I now feel lost because um, I didn't even know that world existed. So I, I just, I have a lot of respect for millennials. Thank you for mentioning that. <laughs> that uh, I guess makes me proud to represent millennials. It, it also reminds me a little bit, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Jennifer Aker's work at Stanford as well. She talks about this. She's, she's a good friend. She's a good friend. Oh, no way. Yeah. Small world. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she, she's actually an advisor for, for Garten as well. So oh, nice. very small world. But uh, she, I took her class uh, designing for happiness when I was at Stanford and um, just so many great concepts. And one of the concepts was around savoring and, and that also changing with age. So th 30s, I remember, is all about conquering the world. And then it becomes, you know, once you get closer to your 60s, it's much more about kind of that grounded Zen state and feeling of total contentment. And so that definition of happiness seems to change over time as well. well it does. It, it's, uh, happiness is, is a young person's sport. And, um, and in the US, the Declaration of Independence, the, the pursuit of happiness. If you actually look in, the, in some dictionaries, you will see that the definition of pursuit is to chase with hostility. <laughs> do we chase do we chase happiness with hostility yes at, at, at christmas time at the mall i think but yeah so I, I think happiness is sort of a young person's sport and contentment is the older person's sport and contentment speaks a little bit more to appreciating tranquility having gratitude for what you do have um and becoming a first class noticer you know, noticing things more, having the space in your life to notice things as opposed to reacting to things. Um, so, you know, it's part of what those are the, all those things I just talked about are the kinds of things we teach at MEA. No, that's, that's phenomenal. And, and you, and we talked a little bit about millennials, of course, getting a lot of value out of this work too. What about Gen Z and, and younger generations? Like when is it appropriate to get this knowledge. I listen, I, I think, so uh, let me tell you an exercise I started doing when I was 28. You can start doing it when you're 18 um, or 15 or whatever. Um, and so I think it's very relevant to Gen Z. Um, it's called my wisdom book. So when I was 28 years old, I was two years into being the CEO of this boutique hotel company. And I, and I was living in San Francisco. I had one hotel and we had the Loma Prieta earthquake. And basically nobody came to San Francisco for six months. So if you're a hotelier with one hotel and not deep pockets, not a lot of cash, um, if when something like that happens, you know, and you, you no longer have hotel guests, like how do you stay open? So I actually took an old journal of mine and that I actually, a journal I'd never written in, but somebody had given it to me as a gift. And I wrote on the front of my wisdom book. 
And every weekend, I would make a list of the four to six or eight different key lessons I had had of that week. So it was not a journal in the sense of, of what I felt emotionally. It was actually the lesson I'd learned. And so it was relatively brief, no more than a paragraph, often just a sentence or two or three. And what I was doing that I didn't realize at the time was that I was metabolizing my experience. And metabol metabolized experience is what wisdom is all about. <laughs> so if you can be more intentional and conscious about saying, ah, let me use an example. An example would be, and now to me, this is really obvious, but back then it wasn't. Yeah. If you're gonna if you're gonna have a meeting of people in your company, for example, and you know there are one or two critics who will be coming to the meeting, show your presentation to them of what you're gonna present before the meeting, get their feedback, and actually, if 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 appropriate, incorporate some of their uh, their feedback into what you're gonna present. Because what it means is when you actually do the presentation, they're probably going to be a little bit more supportive and they won't derail the presentation. So that's a pretty obvious thing to me today. But when I was 28 years old, that wasn't obvious at all. It's not. Yeah. So, so, the, so I just think there's, a, there's something to be said for mm, digesting the lessons you're having along the way making note of them. Today, I, I, I have nine different uh, wisdom journals. I now just use a, a Google Doc instead. But those lessons I learned accelerated my process of becoming wise. So switching a little bit to our, our audience as well on the corporation side, what, what can corporations do to spread your message? Well, you know, it's been it's been very encouraging to see how many companies have embraced MEA's philosophy by sending their employees down here to our Baja campus and soon to our Santa Fe, New Mexico, New Mexico campus, or even our online programs. One of the questions, one of the things I think that any company could do is when you're doing employee satisfaction surveys, also known as work climate surveys, basically just like your check-ins with your employees, how are people doing? Ask a question. Um, on your survey, which is beyond your boss, who in the company do you look to for advice or wisdom? Hmm. And, and if you're if you're a small company like four people, you know probably not that important. But if you're if you're a company of you know fifty people or more, highly recommend this. And the reason I recommend it is because it helps to make tangible the thing that's intangible. There are people in, in your company who are the wisdom keepers. They're the ones who are very collaborative and very accessible. They're the ones who people in the organization often reach out to. They're not necessarily the most senior people in your company. And so why do you want to identify them? Why, we create like what, what we call a heat map, the heat map of where the wis, where's the wisdom residing in the organization. And the reason that's valuable is number one is to just, uh, you know, give recognition to those people who are almost like being informal mentors in the org and that's part of the value. But secondly, if you're a company of some size and you're looking at how do you create learning and development in your organization affordably and how do you create um, like maybe in-house coaches, mm -hmm. guess what? You, you have your list of your top 10 in-house coaches by the seeing the results of this. And what you could do is as we did at Airbnb is go to some of these people on this list and say to them, have you ever thought about being a coach? Have you ever wanted to, do some coaching training and would you like to do that part-time in the company or in one case someone became a full-time in-house coach because of this and it really helped us to actually look at how do we how do we uh dispense and and accelerate wisdom in the organization uh and it wasn't always older people i mean sometimes the people who were perceived as you know having the, the wisdom in their organization were people who were younger and they, those people re, were really wise. So it's, it's not, wisdom is not necessarily exclusively correlated with age. What we've done is we implemented a program called Donut, which is just kind of informally <clears throat> setting up relations every week to basically have an informal chat for 30 minutes. 
um, don't love the idea of it being called donut, but <laughs> given you know the health and wellness focus, but maybe yeah. you know, it's a vegan monk fruit sweetened donuts, so it's all good, ancient grains. <laughs> but uh, no, just just joking. But it's it's been really valuable because I get to connect with others I've not spoken to in a long time, and it's just that sense of connection, and then being even more intentional about it, and having a mentorship based relationship around it seems seems really really great. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of curious too, if uh, you ever think about, is there an ROI in, in what you're doing for companies as well? Like, is there a way to measure that? Because we've been thinking through that uh, a lot at Garden too. Yeah, there's, um, there's well, for the, there's, first of all, there's a lot of reasons why companies want to create more intergenerational collaboration. Right. Um, we now have, for the very first time, five generations in the workplace. Um, most companies don't have five, but you can have five today. Um, and, and therefore learning how to create that intergenerational collaboration is, is, is like creating an, a potluck where, where each generation brings to the table what they know, what they do or know best. And um, so it's significant. I mean, even at Garden, we have definitely five generations of, of, of workers and it's, is it's, that right? it's wow, been a total that's, joy, that's actually. It's been a total well, joy. I, I, I think the key is to realize the value of that. And there's a lot of talk. We had seen so much evidence and research about the importance of uh, diversity. Um, and the, foc the focus has predominantly been gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation. But age diversity is a thing as well. And uh, in Germany, Germany has come out with a bunch of research that has shown that intergenerational teams uh, are actually much more effective than te uh, teams that actually are more exclusive to one or two generations. So, you know, it's partly because how the brain works. A younger brain works differently than the older brain. Um, the younger brain is, has fluid intelligence, very focused, very linear, very qu quick problem solving. An older brain um, is better at cr crystallized intelligence, the idea of systemic thinking um, and being able to see peripherally. Uh, whereas the young brain's focus, older brain is much more peripheral. Um, and is able to go from left brain to right brain more easily and more nimbly. So those are some technical reasons, but let's also just realize in a, in a world where there's <clears throat> too many jobs and not enough workers, which is true in many places, um, learning how to create a workplace where older workers are encouraged to stay longer. Um, and, and sometimes they don't want to, that's fine. Sometimes they want to go to part-time, but many companies haven't really figured out how to say, okay, yeah, you can go from five to three days a week. Yeah. You will, you know, your, your, your salary will, yeah. Post-retirement age, are you saying? So yeah. staying longer post-retirement well, age or? Say, stay, yeah, staying post-retirement age um, and feeling hmm. like, okay, I can move, you know, to three days a week instead of five. My salary, salary will be cut by 40%, but that's what I would prefer to do. But a lot of people feel like they have to leave because like, oh, I, you know, I have to leave at age 60 or 65. But if you're going to live till 100 or 90, many people need to keep working just because they need to keep making money. Um, so I actually think there's a lot of companies who are getting smarter about how do you bring back retired workers who are, you know, who retired too early. They realized after two That's years out of the workplace, yeah. they they didn't like being retired, um, and they they want they wanted to actually come back to the workplace, and so, but they felt a little ashamed or embarrassed, like oh well, uh, and so you know those companies have gotten smart about going back out to their retire retirees, especially the ones who are in good standing, especially the ones who are well regarded, and saying, would you like to come back part time, and it's it's a it's 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 not a retirement; it's a rehirement, um, and, and and I like to call it like rehirement. The, 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 the boomerang generation, like these are boomers who are coming back, boomeranging back to their place. So uh, yeah, I think I think there's a so much value, and I think um, it's 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 a form of diversity that hasn't been given as much attention, but I think we will see more of that, especially since we have an aging population. You know, the average age of, of workers, the average age of an employee in, in the workplace is older than it was uh, 10 years ago, significantly older, actually. And the fastest growing, this is an interesting stat from the U.S. Department of Labor, the fastest growing um, segment of the workplace, uh, demographically, age-wise, is workers 60 and older. Really? And that's partly yeah. because, 
Yeah, that's partly as a percentage relative to the past, partly because people are staying in the workplace longer, people are coming back into the workplace, and the baby boomer generation is a very large generation. So, um, so that there's a, there's, you know, it, but most companies don't think that way. <laughs> so. And, and from an individual standpoint, there's also a sense of meaning. I mean, I'm thinking about the Blue Zone studies, and one of the key things is that social network, sense of meaning, and, and it really provides that. Uh, the company can really be a lot more than, than, than what it is. I mean, I've, I've seen some unfortunate stats, too, where the workplace is the fifth leading cause of death, um, which is really gruesome. And it, doesn't, it should not be that way. Companies should be environments where you discover yourself, you, you fulfill your purpose, and you, know, you, 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 you work as much as you want, and you age you know, gracefully through that. You have your great social circles, all of that. And it's just so much more. And, and, and with bringing people, uh, baby boomers, back I, I think it starts fulfilling more of that purpose because you as you said you create that wisdom that comes back into the company you create that purpose that comes back into the company and so it's uh it's, that's really encouraging for me to hear that so dr phil pizzo at stanford uh he, he ran the stanford medical center for many years and um, he has shown in his research that the three most important foundational elements for people uh, after around age 50 are purpose community and wellness mm -hmm. and purpose and community often when people retire they lose it they lose purpose they lose community they and and so you know it's part of the reason why people's uh, mortality is accelerated by two years when they die right. the part that the part it's interesting michael is that purpose and wellness i get it when people retire they lose that why would anybody lose wellness once they retire and the number one reason i mean you'd think that your wellness would get better because you have more time in your yeah, life time, exactly. but it, but but in fact, it's the opposite. It's what you lose is structure and discipline. And so people, uh, people right. you lose structure, discipline, and this desire, the feeling that you have to look good when you come to the workplace. Mm -hmm. So if you're just hanging out at home watching TV or whatever, you'll, you gain 10 or 15 pounds because you're not actually moving around as much. And you say, oh, I'll go to the gym next week, not this week. Right. And, and, so there's an element of the discipline of, of, of work that actually helps people to uh, improve their wellness. And, and this is, uh, yeah, that's one of my kind of key questions as well around well-being. Um, and from what you've, you've said, that definitely seems to be true. But tell me a little bit more about this notion of employee well-being having a direct correlation to creating indispensable and, uh, you know, great employees for companies. You know, a company with without well-being in the company is not necessarily a company that is creating great products and services for the customers. And the reason I say that is I, I'm a big believer in karmic capitalism. What goes around comes around. Um, and what that basically means is if when I think of, you know, uh, I remember Herb Kelleher, who was the CEO uh, of Southwest Airlines, Airlines for 37 years, and he was a mentor of mine. He said, the customer comes second. It's the employee mm -hmm. who comes first because if the employee doesn't mm -hmm. come first in how the company thinks, um, then the, the link from employee to customer is gonna be very tenuous, uh, especially in any, any company in the service industry, which is two thirds of the world's, world's GDP. So long story short is, I think it's really important, um, not just as a platitude, but just as a business strategy instead to say, and I wrote a book on this called Peak, How Great Companies Get Their Mojo from Maslow. The whole theory was like, okay, you create a great culture in the company. It yeah. leads to enthusiastic employees and engaged employees. If you do that well, it leads to um, uh, loyal customers. And therefore, you grow, grow market share. You just spend less on marketing. And then you have a profitable and sustainable business and a great business model. And with the profits from that business model, you invest back in culture. So it's a virtuous circle. And it's a virtuous circle that is has been proven as you as long as you take enough time to look for the results of it. The challenge with many public ca uh, market capital based or, or companies is that if you expect to make an investment in culture and employees and feel like you have to actually see the results at the bottom line within one quarter. Oh yeah, not, that's going to be challenging. You're not, you're not recognizing what's going to happen, yeah. and that is one of the challenges. One of, with public market capitalism, um, 
is is the fact that the uh, expectation of returns um, mean that you focus on the short term. And in the short term, the best thing you can do for your bottom line is pay your people less and charge your customers more. And, but that that model of paying your people less, charging your customer more, more is not a sustainable model. That's a sh- way to create short term profits to sell your company or to you know increase your stock price. But in the long run, if you really are trying to create a sustainable business, then you know you got to invest in culture and, and the company and and the employees. It's sort of like the pressures of the public markets are at odds with what's what we know is actually really good from a nat- natural standpoint. For and- sure. Yeah, at, at Garten, we, we're definitely taking a stance for employee well-being. So our mission is to empower people to live healthy and blissful lives. But what that translates into is to really make corporate well-being a competitive advantage. And it does, it's not a one-quarter thing. It's, it's a complete yeah. investment. It's a shift into investing into the culture. It's uh, really a mindset shift, very similarly, where um, one analogy to draw is if you're a high performance athlete and you find yourself in an environment where you're eating, you know, white sugar, white fats, ultra processed foods, you know, white bread, what's your performance going to be like? You know, you're not going to be at your best because this doesn't feed uh, the body. And very similarly, if you see uh, knowledge workers as high performance athletes and they're still getting that same, you know, this type of ultra processed food. You know, they're working way too much. They're not going to sleep on time. Um, you know, they're not having any exercise. They're sitting all the time. It's just, you're not creating a culture of well-being and your results will suffer. And it sounds like based on the book from Peak, you can actually measure that through oh, you can. You know, less marketing costs, more profitability. That's, that's fascinating. There's also a, a company, uh, I'm sorry, a, a book from a few years ago called Firms of Endearment. Um, <laughs> and for, it, it actually shows quite, quantitatively some of the results of this. There's also a Harvard Business Review um, issue from, I think it was January, February, 2012. Yeah, 2012. Um, it has a happy face on the cover. And it talks about the the whole issue was on the, um, the linkage between happy employees and long-term profits. Um, and, you know, John Mackey's work with uh, conscious capitalism uh, and his book called that also focuses on this as well. That's 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 really great. I mean, I've recently read a study. I think it just got published uh, about a year ago, and it basically said that companies who invest in employee well-being and health and safety in the workplace outperform the S and P five hundred by two percent a year. So over ten years, you know, that's at least twenty percent. So what's twenty percent an increase in market cap really worth to you as well? So I think there's different ways to to make the case of ROI, not only, you know, are there lower costs, but there also increases in market cap as well as a result. So that's, that's, uh, it's, it's fascinating. And, and it goes totally against what you mentioned, the short-term thinking. It's really about long-term, long-term investment. What else do you think needs to shift around, you know, this message of well-being in companies or this message around mindset around aging? Uh, let me tell, let me tell you something that we're doing. Um, that's really unusual. And I don't know anybody else is doing this. And and when I say we, I mean the Modern Elder Academy. So we have about um, 16 senior leaders in the company. And the number one thing I heard from them fourth quarter of of 2021 was how burned out they were. And for all kinds of reasons. I mean, it's just understandable. We've heard that very rampantly throughout the whole in the US, but also globally, I think, you know, the pandemic, Zoom, et cetera. So we we we're try, we decided to trial something this year because one of the things that's challenging in the in the world we live in is especially with Zoom calls and you know you know we've got our phones. There's so many ways for us to connect with each other, and then th- there's very much a feeling like there's there's a permeable boundary. Um, and Jack Welch long ago talked about the boundaryless organization, and he meant it not in this way, but we've sort of become a boundaryless organization in the sense that. You're expected to be on call at any time, especially if you're an international company and there's meetings going on at various different times. So we asked each of our senior leaders in the company to make a list of the boundaries they wanted to try to adhere to in 2022. Then go over that list of boundaries with their boss, with their direct supervisor, 
And once their direct supervisor gave a thumbs up and said, those look great. Um, we then had a meeting of all of our senior leaders where each of us said, here are, here are my boundaries for 2022. So everybody could hear each other's boundaries. We then put all those boundaries into a Google Doc so that our administrative team, when they're trying to actually organize meetings, for example, can actually keep in mind the boundaries. We also took, said, you know, the, the fourth week of the month, we always will make it a no meeting week, except for if two people want to have a meeting, they certainly can, you know, but there won't be any standing meetings of weekly meetings for, for groups, teams, et cetera, um, unless there's emergencies. <clears throat> so what we did is by, and then once a quarter, we let the 16 people who come up with the boundaries <clears throat> tell the rest of the group, am I a green, yellow, or red with respect to how I'm doing with my boundaries? What's worked? What are the best practices, uh, et cetera? Um, and so that became part of our practice. And here's the, the kicker. At year end, um, based upon their own self-determination, <clears throat> if they can say that they feel like they, by year end, became green on their boundaries, they get a 5% bonus, self-determined. Oh, wow. So so in essence, not only are we saying this is important, but we're paying people to create boundaries, try to adhere to them, talk about it with their boss, share best practices with, with each other, and at year end, get a financial benefit from it. That's that's really fascinating. Like, what what kind of form do these boundaries take? Is it just uh, don't schedule meetings, you know, at, at these times, or it could be so? Like, let me give you. I'll give you three or four examples. A boundary could be: I won't work on Sundays. I'm mean, gonna have an out of office uh, message on Sunday. And everybody had at least three boundaries at, at minimum. Um, some people have more, but um, I won't. Someone might say, "I won't don't you know won't be available on Sundays." Uh -huh. uh, another person could say. Um, I'm going to take two vacations this year, a week each. I'll take more than that, but I'll take two where I am completely off, off the grid for those, those two weeks, meaning I will not be responsive to anything anybody sends me uh, during those weeks. Um, another one could be, yeah, I'm, I, we're doing meetings at, that are, at our 7 a.m. my time. You know, they start at 7 a.m. Right. Can, you know, I, would like to start my day no earlier than 8 a.m. So how can we actually make that work? Sometimes people's boundaries are at odds with each other. <laughs> exactly, honest. I'm sure there's some conflicts here and there. <laughs> I mean, especially when you have people in different area codes or, or, or uh, yeah, or, or time zones. Time zones, yeah. um, Some Some, a person might have a boundary that relates to, um, they got pulled into too many other teams and that they're, they're, they're not gonna be on more than three strategic teams all at once. Uh, you know, we have a lot of teams in our company. It's like, you know what, that's my boundary. I, you know, if I'm gonna actually add a team and I've already got three, I'm gonna have to drop off a team. So that's a good, those are the examples. And what's encouraging is the overall cult, culture of the company has gotten better as, as a result. Yeah, there's so much, uh, you know, good wisdom. <laughs> Getting back to the topic of wisdom in, in creating a, a structure like that. I mean, in, in some sense, it reminds me on one hand of, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of conscious leadership and the concept of above and below the line. Mm -hmm. It's really creating an above the line culture where it's about, you know, what do I take responsibility for? And it, you take responsibility for your life in a way and the life working. And it's not just, oh, the company's imposing everything, I can't do anything, kind of this victim, victimhood below the line mentality is such a great uh, way of implementing that. I, I really love that thought. I, I have to... I, I hope it catches on with other people. <laughs> because honestly, I can say halfway through the year, totally worth it. And the other thing that it reminds me of too, organizationally, what we've done is we've basically created well-being boundaries to basically take a stance for them. So what we do is we have an, a, a policy called garden time. And so we do uh, twice a day, uh, one at 8.30 in the morning and 3 p.m. in the afternoon, well-being breaks. And you can choose to meditate. You can choose to go on a meditative walk. You can do yoga. You, know, you can read, spiritual text, what, what, whatever you want to do during those times. And then we've also declared a four-day work week but we call it specifically, you know, garden time on Friday, because there are going to be some individuals that absolutely get well-being out of working. And we give them the opportunity to do that, but have everybody decide what's, what's important to them. 
because uh, to, to your point, it creates personal integration, it creates personal time, personal well-being, time for that. And so being able to do it structurally through an organizational standpoint, um, I think is very powerful. And, and I hope more companies adopt uh, techniques, um, you know, like yours, like ours. Um, I, I definitely want to uh, run this by our, our C-level leadership team to see what they think about <laughs> this type of bonus. I think it'd be very popular. <laughs> Is there anything that you would love to tell your, you know, 25 or 30 year old self today that, you know? Yeah, I actually, I, so I have a daily blog called Wisdom Well, and um, I wrote a blog post uh, in ju early June called the 62 pieces of advice or bit, 62 bits of advice I would, uh, I wish I'd learned earlier um, because I'm turning 62 this year. Uh, Congratulations. You know, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, I would say that the, one of the key things that I've learned is not to take things so personally. Um, you know, how, how everything and um, to learn how to create the space between stimulus and response. I love that Viktor Frankl quote between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is your power to choose your response. And in your response lies your growth and your freedom. And to learn how to be more emotionally responsive as opposed to emotionally reactive is to me one of the signs of wisdom and one of the most important paths of what it means to be you know, a mature human. So I, I would say those are some of the things I would tell myself at age 25. Hmm. Really, uh, an enlightened perspective. Uh, yeah, thank you for sharing that. And and today has just been incredible. I was so looking forward to uh, to chatting with you and uh, to anybody that's listening. I, I definitely encourage you and hope that you're able to learn more about Chip and his incredible journey. If you go to his web website, it's just chipconley.com, right? Chipconley.com, and then also modernelderacademy.com. Modern Elder and, Academy and, and, and Wisdom Well. Just if you look for on, on the Modern Elder Academy site, there's the Wisdom Well blog. And the Wisdom Well blog. Excellent. And really encourage you to take a lot of the lessons here, apply that wisdom into your own life, regardless of your generation. So if you're Gen Z, you know, <laughs> you can you can definitely apply it today. And uh, sure. with that said, uh, have a great day. Have a wonderful weekend. It was such a joy. Thank you, Chip, for joining us. Thank you, Michael. It's been great to be with you. Bye.